What is up? Good mic work. Back at you. What you're about to watch here is a re-upload. As most of you know, recently, the WWE went through and blocked about a dozen of my videos on YouTube. A lot of my older pay-per-view and DVD reviews, and a few other commentaries where I had used some video footage. You know, with no audio, just me talking over it, but somehow it got matched or reported or whatever. And WWE blocked the videos. I tried to dispute them. They all came back denied. No big deal. Whatever, right? I wasn't monetizing these videos back then because I was using a little bit of video footage. I assumed it was all protected under fair use, but YouTube guidelines and copyright laws are all fucked up. You know, me, ever the optimist, I'm always positive. I make the best out of a horrible situation, and I'm not even that freaked out. Most of these videos that got taken down were two to three, and I think maybe even four years old in some cases. So they're very old, but at the same time, it disappointed a lot of you that said, oh, I like going back and watching some of those old DVD reviews or whatever. So what I decided to do is re-upload all of them, and I'm just going to sprinkle them out to you, maybe like one a week here in the next, you know, several weeks, just to kind of slowly get them all back in. They're going to lose a ton of views. Most of these had, you know, 50, 60, 70,000 views on them. So I'm not going to get those type of numbers, obviously, on these videos. But these are just a way to give them back to you so you guys have them. All of the issues that the previous video had with the video footage I've just taken out. I've put the new graphics up, give you guys a more updated intro, and remind you to visit my website, goodmikeworkcommentaries.com, and follow me on Twitter at goodmikework. Like my Facebook page and like this video. This video is going to need it since this is a re-upload. It's very old. I could use all the likes I can get, share it, and uh, just enjoy the old content from me. I will warn you that these commentaries were mostly done with a really crappy microphone with no pop filter, so this is not my best work. It's not quite as sharp. It was still a hobby for me back then, and my YouTube channel was still in its infancy. And uh, plus my opinions. Who knows what I even said? The statute of limitations on my opinions are gone. Don't give me shit in the comments about anything you hear here. I don't even remember what I said. So if you disagree with something, uh, who cares? I probably don't even feel that way anymore. So I apologize for the dated content and the quality being a little bit less, but I didn't want the videos to completely go away. I figured I would just re-upload them to you so you can continue to enjoy them and I can replenish my pay-per-view and DVD review playlist down below on my channel. So sit back and relax and enjoy an old school re-upload. Surprise! Welcome to Good Mike Works Pay-Per-View and DVD Reviews Volume 12. You know what? I had to push this one to the front of the line. I had completely forgot that this DVD was coming out, and when I saw the advertisement on Monday Night Raw that the DVD was going to be released the next day, I said, that's it. I'm going to run out and get it right away, watch it, and review it as soon as possible. So this will be a nice little weekend treat for you guys. I'm going to review the DVD of the Macho Man Randy Savage, because I got to tell you, this one hits home for me. You realize this DVD is coming out 20 years and one week after the Macho Man left the WWE back in 1994? I know I've mentioned this several times throughout the years, but the Macho Man Randy Savage was extremely influential to me as a wrestling fan. He is on, you know, my top two or three list as far as his character and what he meant to wrestling and how he personally affected my life and how much I liked him. You know, other than Bret Hart, I can't think of anybody that I enjoyed watching more, that I respect more than Randy Savage, maybe Undertaker, and maybe even Shawn Michaels if he wasn't such a dick in his personal life. But Randy Savage, to me, is... You know, he is an icon, one of my favorite in-ring workers of all time. He was amazing, highly athletic, and his charisma, my God, you know, nobody could touch him. There was nobody like him. There was no character ever that presented himself the way the Macho Man Randy Savage did, and I have the utmost respect for him, and he is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time, and his death hit me hard. I was very shook up by it because he was somebody, you know, that was a giant chunk, you know, of my younger life, you know, that felt like it died that same day. And when you combine that with all the history with the WWE and how he left there and never came back and then things never got reconciled and here we are 20 years later and now Randy is dead and they're finally getting around to doing a documentary on his life, you know, to me it's just like, ah, oh, this is like 15 years too late. I just wish we could have seen Randy Savage uh, be a part of this documentary himself. I wish we could have seen Randy Savage, you know, standing up uh, in front of everybody at a Hall of Fame ceremony while he was still alive. Uh, but instead we have to settle for this. But, you know, it's the next best thing because at least...
least WWE is honoring Randy, and at least us as fans can take a look back at his life and his career. And a lot of you who weren't young enough to remember him in his heyday, a lot of you probably remember him from WCW and some of the things he did there. But, you know, back in the 80s, you know, and even prior to his WWE days, you know, he was uh, he was very fun to watch even back then. I preferred the 1980s Macho Man over the 1990s Macho Man. I like the headbands and the long sparkly robes better than the really colorful jacket and the cowboy hat. I like that old school Macho Man the best, and he was great. Watching some of that old school footage, you know, he was a rough looking savage, honestly, which is where his name came from. I loved him. I absolutely loved him. And I don't want to sound like too much of a sap, but you have to understand, you know, how much the career of Macho Man Randy Savage meant to me as a wrestling fan. You know, it was so important to me. When I look back at the fondest memories I have in wrestling, Macho Man occupies a lot of those memories. So this DVD had to be done. I had to come up here and review it right away because these DVD reviews are kind of new to my channel, so I find myself reviewing DVDs that are multiple years old. So whenever one like this comes out, I want to try to review it right away because it's new and fresh and a lot of people might be interested in what I have to say about it as opposed to me reviewing a DVD that came out four years ago. So this will probably be the procedure I'll follow for the future, you know, just like I did with the Paul Heyman DVD when that came out, you know. So any new DVD or new documentary that's interesting that a lot of people are buzzing about, I'll try to review it as soon as it comes out and then in between. I'll review some of the older DVDs. And as promised, I will have two pay-per-view reviews coming to you. My next couple will be pay-per-view reviews because I know I've been doing a lot of DVDs, but I had to push this one, like I said, to the front of the line because, hey, it's the Macho Man Randy Savage. The documentary was interesting. It had kind of a different tone or feel to it. I really enjoyed it. I liked it a lot. I thought the WWE did a very good job of telling uh, Randy Savage's story, and it was great that Lanny Poffo had agreed uh, to come on and do this. Even his mother was in this. Randy Savage's mother was interviewed for this documentary and she was great. I'm not sure how old she is, but I can't believe she would be a day younger than 90 at least. So the fact that this uh, little old lady is up there completely coherent talking about her son and uh, all of the memories of Macho Man was really great to see that. I'm glad she participated. And what was different about this documentary is, you know how like in previous documentaries, how I just reviewed Stone Cold and The Rock, you know, they kind of chronicle their careers, you know, they chronicle their start, how they got into the business, all of their angles and feuds, and just based basically go in chronological order, you know what I mean? They really didn't do that with Randy Savage. Now, although they highlighted a lot of great moments and matches from his career, they really didn't go through it all and explain every feud in detail. This was more like, you know, Randy Savage's life, who he was as a person, and they talk a lot about his relationships with people like Vince McMahon, with Elizabeth, with Hulk Hogan. Very interesting stuff. And it was actually a nice break for a change because when I was going to review this DVD, you know, I wanted to, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about, about who Macho Man Randy Savage is and talk about his life and not have to worry about getting into the details with every little fucking feud he was in and things like that. So this documentary, I thought, was a really well done tribute to Randy Savage. And although I wish this could have been done years ago, although I wish Randy Savage could have been a participant in this himself before he died, you know, this was still really nice to see and it still hits very, very close to home for me because of what Randy Savage meant to my life. The documentary even starts off in a different way than most do. It starts with the wheel of a Jeep just spinning, which uh, Macho Man was driving a Jeep the day he died. And they show all sorts of news clips from CNN and ESPN and others, you know, on the day that Macho Man died, all of the news outlets reporting it. And they show his brother Lanny standing in front of the tree that Randy Savage's Jeep struck when he suffered the heart attack. And you have pictures and everything hanging on the tree. So it was a very sad kind of beginning. Lanny is narrating it, saying how much he misses and loves his brother. And, uh, you know, it just makes Uh, makes you real sad. It's been three and a half years now since Randy Savage died, but, you know, just still way too soon. It's a shame that he's like so many of these other wrestlers, like Ultimate Warrior, like Eddie Guerrero, uh, even Brian Pillman, that died of, uh, you know, early age from heart attacks. It just makes you sick. It just gives you this horrible feeling inside. You know, all these memories these guys gave us and they're not here anymore. So the DVD started off, you know, almost in a really somber tone. They talk a lot about his hometown in the beginning, how he grew up in the suburb of uh, Chicago, Downers Grove, Illinois, I believe. And how I mentioned his mother was on the DVD. She told a lot of stories about how Randy was as a kid. And you can clearly see that this kid back then, he must have had ADD or something. Because it seemed like he was just all over the place, you know, very high strung, you know, very spazzy, you know, couldn't sit still, fidgety, that sort of thing. And you could see that come out in his wrestling character years down the line. 
I mean, a lot of people thought Macho Man was batshit nuts. I was one of them. They also talk about his dad, Angelo Poffo, who was a wrestler and how he, uh, you know, really instilled values in them and, and gave them, you know, lifelong lessons that they still use to this day, or at least Lanny does. And what a great, respectful person he was. And they even included the great story of him being in the Guinness Book of World Records for breaking the sit-up record of over 6,000 sit-ups. Unbelievable. But he sounded like a really good father. You know, aside from his wrestling career, you know, at home as a dad, he seemed like he really instilled his sons, you know, with the importance of hard work and what it can do for you. It really seemed, uh, you know, listening to Lanny Poffo in the documentary that, uh, you know, he played a huge role in who his sons turned out to be in their lives. They talked about how Randy Savage played all sports, he loved everything, and he particularly excelled at baseball. And he got really good at baseball. Most of you, I mean, it's pretty much common knowledge that Randy Savage was a baseball player before wrestling, but I suppose there's some of you that might not know that. So if you didn't know that, he was good. Let me tell you, he was damn good. He signed a minor league deal. He tried forever to get into the major leagues. Technically was a professional baseball player, got cut a couple of times and it was really cool to see Larry Herndon being interviewed for this thing. Larry Herndon is a name from my past in my old Detroit Tiger days when they won the World Series in 1984. He was on that team, and he's actually a coach for their Lakeland farm team, and Lakeland is where Detroit Tigers hold their spring training. When I lived in North Carolina, I would drive down to Lakeland every single spring and watch the spring training games. I did that for like 10 straight years. So it was really cool to see him interviewed for this thing right there in the stadium that I've been to many times. I actually did not know that Larry Herndon and Randy Savage were friends back in the day. And he told a really cool story about how Randy Savage would swing his baseball bats at a tire hanging from a tree, you know, to strengthen his arms and forearms. And it's something that he still uses to this day. And he says he built one of them in his own backyard for his kids. So Randy Savage was a very hard worker who practiced constantly and got really good and was an awesome baseball player and a great hitter. As a matter of fact, uh, back at SummerSlam 1994, if a lot of you guys might have the the tape or the video, uh, I guess over the weekend there they did a promotional softball game with uh, the WWE superstars versus I think local radio DJs or something like that. And it was all done for charity or whatever, but I specifically remember Macho Man hitting a home run in that game, you know, just knocking it right the fuck out of the park. So even when he was older, even when his baseball career was, you know, 15, 20 years behind him, he was still hitting balls out of parks. You know, it was awesome. As good a baseball player as he was, he was never quite good enough uh, to make it on a roster and stay there. He was cut several times, and then finally, I believe he was cut for a third and final time and decided to give up baseball completely and move on to wrestling which apparently he might have been doing a little bit of during his baseball days because they tell a story about how Dusty Rhodes first noticed him uh, in Florida, you know, when Florida Championship Wrestling would run the shows at the Armory. He said he noticed the guys in the crowd wearing baseball outfits because they would leave the game and literally drive to the show, you know, in their uniforms to get to the show on time to watch. And they even said that Macho Man briefly wrestled under a mask, you know, when he was still under a minor league deal because in his deal and in his contract, he really cannot be physical in any other sports or risk injury or anything like that. So I guess he put a mask on to kind of hide that. But once he got cut and was done with baseball, he was able to focus everything on pro wrestling. They then show him transitioning, you know, him putting forth, like I said, all of his efforts into professional wrestling and trying to develop his character and make himself, you know, marketable. And he began that by heavily working out, really increasing his physique because he was more of a tall, skinny guy when he was playing baseball. So now he was beefing up. He was in the gym a lot. He grew the facial hair. He had the big shaggy hair. And, uh, you know, they talk about where he got his name from. He kind of looked like a savage. So he took that as his last name so he could get away from the Pafo name. And the nickname Macho Man apparently came from his baseball days when they would be getting in fights and things like that. So, you know, he was looking for, you know, the total package and when it came to his interview this is something I didn't know you know Randy Savage you know he's he's crazy in his interviews but I never really thought about you know who influenced him and Lanny Poffo had said it was kind of a combination of King Curtis and Pampiro Furpo which is unbelievable I never even put that together and never knew that story and he took a lot of their promo style into his own so he was heavily influenced by lots of guys you know in wrestling and really I think really worked hard and thought a lot about who he wanted to be and that's something you just don't see today because a lot of these wrestlers don't don't have this option they don't have the ability or they're not it's not needed to where they have to come up with their gimmicks and their angles and all of that if you work for the wwe you keep your mouth shut and they fucking do whatever they want with you but with savage it was all up to him you know he had to develop a persona he had to be a pro wrestler and i thought he thought about it you know in such great detail that he had every aspect of his character you know figured out He had the name, he had the look, he had the promo. He didn't have a one out of three, he didn't have two out of three, he had everything. 
And from there, it just goes back to what they talk about with him as a child. Practice makes perfect. So now that Macho Man had the, the outline of the character, now you have to develop it. Now you have to shape it. Now you have to work at it to make it great. And he didn't have to work at it for very long because it seemed right off the bat, when you look at some of the earliest footage of Randy Savage, his promos were still good. Even when he was in the business for two years, he could still cut a promo. His intensity and his unpredictability is what made him so great, and he was perfect for the time. You know, even the look that he had with the long hair and the sunglasses and the headband, you know, very 70s and early 80-ish look to him. And I love those days. It's rare to find really good footage of Macho Man, you know, before he was in WWE. I have a good amount of it, but, you know, anytime you can watch anything, you know, from him when he was younger and when he, when he was coming through the business, that's when, you know, there's some real gems there. They talk about how he got a start working for his dad's promotion, which was a small upstart promotion that rivaled Jerry Lawler's uh, Mid-South Wrestling in Memphis. And I've referenced several times over the years the uh, Loser Leaves Town match between Jerry Lawler and Randy Savage. I have several different copies of that match. It's uh, one of my favorite memories. I even remember way back in the day before the match happened reading an article about it in the magazines or somewhere. I can't remember where now, but I specifically remember the article mentioning that Savage will probably lose to Lawler and head to New York. It was one of the earliest forms of a dirt sheet. And it really helped Savage a lot. When his father's territory and Lawler's territory finally worked together, you know, and brought Savage in, it got him the recognition he needed. And he had some great feuds and great memories down there. And the WWE took notice of it and brought him in around 1985. They show a lot of his early days. When he first came into the WWE in 85, it was cool to see all this old stuff. I even remember when he came in. uh, They did the same thing with Bam Bam Bigelow a couple of years later when they were running promos and vignettes, building up his debut. And then all of the managers started, you know, vying for his services and they were all competing to sign this guy and when Randy Savage came in you know they had a segment where all the managers were in the ring Bobby Heenan Jimmy Hart Mr. Fuji Luscious Johnny Blassie was even in there and then Savage introduces his new manager who turns out to be his wife Miss Elizabeth nobody knew she was his wife at the time but they tell the story on the DVD that they were actually looking for a woman for Savage and they even brought up Missy Hyatt's name now that would have been crazy imagine that imagine if Missy Hyatt would have come in and been Randy Savage's valet instead of Miss Elizabeth I would have hated that. I was never really a fan of Missy Hyatt, and Elizabeth was 100 times more beautiful. So Savage was the one, according to Lanny Poffo anyway, that asked them to screen test Elizabeth, and they liked her right away, ended up bringing her in as his manager, and he announced it in front of the world on TV with all of the other managers in the ring, similar to how they did with Bam Bam Bigelow a few years later when all of the managers were fighting for him, and then he swerved everyone, turned babyface, and announced Oliver Humperdinck as his manager. But with Randy, everything was completely different. This was a girl coming in. You didn't see a whole lot of women at that time, especially women that were this beautiful. And she was so nice and sweet and innocent, and she's managing this asshole, this heel who treats her like shit. But yet she sticks with him anyway. Plus, they always look great together. They always coordinated outfits. They were very cl- colorful. They were very flashy. They were very elegant looking. They looked like superstars. It was a great pairing. The two of them together were, were perfect. I don't think any other woman would have been able to fit that role better than Elizabeth. She just fit for whatever reason. Speaking of things that just fit, his music. What the fuck is that about? Pomp and Circumstance? A goddamn graduation song? He chooses that? That's not the type of music you would think. Some classical piece of music for an absolute savage to come out to the ring to. You would think a guy like Randy Savage would come out to heavy metal or rock and roll or just something a little harder or edgier, you know, and he comes out to this, it's just random as fuck, but you know what? It worked. It was exactly fitting for him. And that's what's one of the most amazing things about wrestling is that sometimes things just fit who they fit. You don't know why. You just get so lucky where a piece of music or a gimmick or a character fits this exact individual so perfectly. And with Randy Savage, when you combine Elizabeth, when you combine his character, his gimmick, his voice, his music, everything was just perfect for who he was. Undertaker is a lot like that, too. So is The Rock. So is Stone Cold. Only those guys can be those guys. Those aren't gimmicks that you can just slap on any run-of-the-mill wrestler and they can get it over just as well. It has to fit you. It has to fit who you are. And Savage was one of the earliest examples of that. Now, once Savage got into the WWE and his foot was in the door and he was there for a little while, apparently he said, hey, you got any room for my little brother? And Lanny Poffo tells a story about how Randy Savage got him into the WWE. I don't really have that many great memories of Lanny Poffo. And speaking of Lanny, by the way, I was appreciative of him for doing this DVD because he's going to be the go-to guy now whenever it comes to anything related to Randy Savage and what the WWE needs to deal with business-wise behind the scenes as far as, you know, maybe next year's Hall of Fame. I'm pretty sure since this DVD has come out, it's almost a given that if they went ahead and did the DVD, interviewed his family for this, it's almost a guarantee that Savage will now eventually be in the Hall of Fame. 
I'm hoping that comes as early as this year, 2015, WrestleMania 31. That would be fantastic. But if not, as long as it happens one day, I'm happy, and he's really the last remaining name other than maybe Owen Hart, who, you know, there's a big controversy there if he can ever go in. And it's pretty much out of the WWE's hands at this point. The ball lays in Martha's court. But for Savage, you know, he's the one name left, you know, to really legitimize it. Savage is in now. Bruno is in now. Warrior, you know, a lot of other guys that WWE has had problems with in the past. Fences have been mended, and they're in the Hall of Fame where they need to be. I'm almost 100% certain that that will be the case for Randy Savage. But with Lanny Poffo, I'm not sure how I feel about him. You know, sometimes he comes off as... I don't know, douchey or something. He's got a lot of these funny little quotes, you know, when he's trying to preach rather than tell the story of Randy Savage's life a couple of times here or there in the DVD. And I understand that. He's trying to make his brother, you know, look as great as possible. I hope he was being 100% truthful in this thing. I'm sure some things are embellished a little bit. Hogan did the same thing. But with Lanny, I'm just kind of on the fence on how I feel about him. On one hand, I'm glad that he participated in this and helped tell the story of Randy Savage. But on the other hand, he just seems like an annoying guy to deal with. I don't know. But as a wrestler, You know, he didn't really do much either. He was leaping Lanny when he first came in. He would come out in a funny little colorful jacket, a lot like what Chris Jericho uh, has worn, jacket that lights up here in his latest run. It sort of resembled that, maybe. And he would throw Frisbees out to the ring for some reason. And he would read a poem before every match. And these were poems that he actually wrote. And a lot of times he would have the poem written on the Frisbee, and then he would throw it into the crowd. But he was basically just a glorified jobber. I cannot recall one single time where Leaping Lanny won a match in the WWE. I remember him losing lots of matches in the WWE. I remember Andre the Giant fucking brutalizing him in a battle royal right before WrestleMania 3. It was Andre's first time in a ring as a heel. And Hogan and Andre were both in the battle royal. Andre got his hands on Lanny Poffo, beat him completely bloody, and tossed him right over the top rope. Fucking brutal for that time. But he maintained a steady job there. They kept him on, even to the point where they changed his gimmick and turned him heel. And then he was just a heel version of a glorified jobber. He was the genius, a completely shitty character that nobody took seriously, got his ass kicked all the time. I do, however, remember him scoring a victory over Hulk Hogan. I think it was on Saturday night's main event or something like that. It was one of those shows, and he actually beat Hulk Hogan via countout. Uh, and uh, I forgot who interfered in that, but somebody came down and cost Hogan the match, obviously. I, it escapes me now. It might have been Savage, but that was probably the biggest victory of his career. Other than that, he was losing all the time or getting his ass kicked or getting his hair cut by Brutus Beefcake or something like that. He was always just kind of made to look like a fool. I don't know, but uh, he wasn't nearly as talented as, br- as his brother. Randy Savage had all the talent in the world. I think Lanny Poffo had a job because of who Randy was. And Lanny Poffo wasn't all bad. I'm not shitting on him. He did do some very, very funny things as the genius. He did write some great poems as Leaping Lanny. So I'm not, you know, crapping on the guy. I got nothing against him. But as far as his wrestling run, there really wasn't much there. But I think it was very nice uh, of Randy Savage to, you know, get his brother a job. That family was very tight. They talked a lot about that in the documentary about how close the family was. And that's so nice to see. Because when it comes to wrestling families, there's a lot of them. And a lot of them have turmoil. A lot of them have bitterness and jealousy and, and problems throughout the years. Look what happened to the once mighty Hart family. Once Owen Hart died and people started getting divorced, the family was torn and some of these kids weren't even speaking to each other for years. It wasn't until they inducted Stu Hart into the Hall of Fame that it looked like he got them all back together under one roof again. So still to this day, I don't know where all of their tensions lie, but with the Poffos, they were always together. Lanny and Randy were never at odds. Randy never had a feud with his dad. Nobody hated anybody. They were all together. They were all united as one. And you hear about the rumors how Randy Savage said, hey, if I'm in the Hall of Fame, I want my whole family to go into the Hall of Fame. You know, apparently that was one of his conditions or something like that, which I think is kind of bullshit. Randy deserves to go in by himself. Randy is more popular than the rest of his family combined. I have no problem with the Poffos going in as a family. They definitely deserve it, but Macho also needs to go in as a single. He needs to be one of those guys that's inducted twice, for sure, because Randy needs to headline one year. Randy needs to be the main guy. But the closeness of the Poffo family, especially told from the perspective of Lanny Poffo, was very apparent and uh, very heavily featured in this documentary. And they also spent a lot of time, several different times throughout the DVD, just talking about Randy Savage's persona, talking about his promo, talking about his character. Like I said at the beginning, they didn't really chronicle through each step of his career, feud by feud, title by title. They didn't really do that at all. They just talked talked about Randy Savage as a whole and highlighted a few big moments from his career. That's it. So it's kind of hard to review this DVD without unintentionally jumping all over the place, but they showed a lot of footage from more of his promos around the time of like 1987, 1988. They even showed a couple of outtakes from uh, some of his promos that he 
was cutting on Hulk Hogan for his WrestleMania 5 match. Just very cool stuff to see on here. They do briefly chronicle his Intercontinental title run. They show where he beat Tito Santana for the Intercontinental title. I believe that was in the Boston Garden. Danny Davis was the referee for that match. Danny Davis would wind up being a heel referee who would be suspended for life and turn into a wrestler not a short time after this. And they also talk really in detail about his feud with Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. And Ricky the Dragon Steamboat was interviewed for this DVD as well. That was a special time for me, guys. I mean, I've talked about it many times. I was there. I was in the building that night. I was breathing the same air that Randy and Ricky were breathing that evening, and it was one of the greatest matches in the history of the wrestling business. Everybody on this DVD that was interviewed said it was the greatest match of all time. I still think that's debatable, but it's definitely one of the greatest of all time and one of my favorites that I've ever seen. And Ricky the Dragon Steamboat gets emotional. I mean, he actually chokes up when he was talking about it because it was such a special time. It was such a special moment, and it's such a great match and and Ricky says it would have been great you know if Randy Savage was still alive and the two of them could get together and, and talk about those old times and you know just what a special time in the business that was and it was also kind of cool to hear some of the backstories about this match. Ricky Steamboat gives credit to the Macho Man for being such an insane perfectionist. He goes into unimaginable detail on every little aspect of every match, and he takes everything so seriously. And Steamboat said that Savage had listed, you know, just a, on a sheets of paper, 100 spots right in a row, one through 100. He literally had every single spot in the match completely laid out, and he expected his opponents to memorize this shit. And Ricky says, sure enough, if you ask him what number 78 is, say fucking arm drag, Irish whip, you know, backdrop, sunset flip, whatever. He must have had a crazy brain. You know, Randy Savage was nuts. He was kind of like Rain Man. To be able to memorize all this shit in a row the way he did was unbelievable, and he took such pride in his matches and his performance and how he looked. And that's a drive and a desire and the attention to detail that, you know, so many guys would lack, you know, in this business that we've seen throughout the years. I think that's why so many guys like Bret Hart and others have so much respect for Randy Savage. Bret Hart was interviewed for this documentary as well, and he put Savage over huge. You know, he called him his hero. I wish those two guys could have worked more together. You know, they were two of my favorites of all time. One of the most common questions I get from fans is, uh, hey, good mic work. Who's on your personal Mount Rushmore? Well, there goes two of your heads right there, Brett and Randy. They also chronicle WrestleMania 4, which was really cool, and what a huge moment this was for Randy Savage. This was very significant. Looking back, some fans might not understand this, but take it from me, from somebody who lived it. You know, this was the first time somebody else other than Hulk Hogan would hold the WWE title. I mean, I know we live in a current age where John Cena is, quote, shoved down your throats, and it seems like he wins all the time. At least between his 78 title reigns, he loses every now and then. Hogan was on a tear for nearly half a decade. And finally, they took the belt off of him and went in a different direction and gave it to a new babyface, a guy that was arguably almost as popular as Hogan, gave it to him in a big 16-man tournament at WrestleMania 4 and launched the Macho Man and let him be the face of the company for a year. And you got to appreciate what a great risk that was because Hogan had been drawing. You know, it's not like Hogan was slowing down. WWE decided to take the belt off of him because they said, hey, we got to do something different here. Hogan was still drawing the houses just as strong as ever, but they actually took the risk and went in a different direction. And Macho Man did a great job. Every wrestler that was in the WWE at that time loved having him as champion. Because he was a great champion, and he was a different champion. He was giving you different matches. You know, right off the bat, he was having street fights with Bad News Brown and rematches with Ted DiBiase. He was faster. He was quicker. He was more exciting to watch. He was just as charismatic as Hulk Hogan, could cut just as good a promo as Hulk Hogan, and because of his relationship with Hulk Hogan, became just as big of a household name as him as well. I loved his run. He was a wonderful WWE champion. The year-long run that he had from 88 to 89 was one of my favorite WWE titles reigns of all time. He sure as hell earned my respect that year. He earned the respect of everyone, every wrestler, every fan, everybody. I'll tell you what, they dig deep into some personal shit in this documentary as well. They go into very uncomfortable detail about his relationship with Hulk Hogan, about his relationship with Elizabeth, and uh, when he was the WWE champion around this time, they talk about how he was in the shadow of Hulk Hogan, there was some real personal problems backstage, and a lot of people in the DVD said, you know, Kevin Nash and others said that uh, even though Savage was a great champion, even though he rivaled Hulk Hogan in popularity, it was still Hogan that was driving the WWE. Basically, Hogan was one, Savage was 1A, and that's exactly how it was, because Savage was WWE 
WWE champion, and a lot of times Hogan was main eventing the shows. Hogan was getting a lot of the spotlight. Savage, I still think, held his own, you know, with Hogan because he was just as charismatic and just as good a character, but really, Hogan was driving the ship. And I will admit, it was pretty predictable back then because during the main event of WrestleMania 4, during the whole celebration with Savage winning the title and Hogan and Elizabeth being in the ring, I said that night, these guys are going to feud. It's only going to be a matter of time before Savage faces Hogan. And back then, you didn't really see a whole lot of babyface matches, so you figured Savage would probably turn heel at some point and give the belt back to Hogan. You knew that the night that he won it. But at least they didn't hotshot it. At least they didn't do it at SummerSlam. They let Savage carry that thing for a full year, you know, which really gave him credibility as being one of the greatest WWE champions ever because he had a very long title reign. And then he came back one year later to the very same building in the very same wrestling ring that he won the title in the year before, and he dropped it to Hogan at WrestleMania V. The Mega Powers explode. That was a great match, too. That was one of my favorite WrestleMania matches. It was a good Hogan match for once. Savage did awesome things, so whatever problems these two guys were having behind the scenes, it certainly didn't translate in the ring because Savage did the job for him and did it well. Everybody that ever talks about Randy Savage has always mentioned that he's all business, regardless of whatever's going on behind the scenes he can still do business in the ring when business needs to be done. So if he truly did have some internal issues with Hulk Hogan around that time, you couldn't tell from the WrestleMania match, that's for sure. They keep right on the vibe with uncomfortable relationships of Randy Savage and talk about in detail about his relationship with Miss Elizabeth. And a lot of people were telling stories of them remembering how jealous and how psychotic Randy Savage would be about Elizabeth. There were stories that ranged anywhere from Savage wanting Elizabeth to come to the ring with him just so he could keep an eye on her to Randy locking her in a locker room while he wasn't there and telling her not to leave or Randy giving her 21 TV dinners when he was going to go on the road for three weeks and told her not to leave the house. Getting very jealous and uneasy around Hogan because of how Hogan touched her, looked at her, or things like that. So a lot of people made mention to how jealous and crazy Randy Savage was when it came to Elizabeth. Now, Landy Poffo, he kind of downplays the whole thing on the documentary tries to play it off as if it wasn't that bad and claims that if people say that, they're either mistaken or they're lying, but there are enough people saying it and enough people that remember how savage was that it's really, you you really almost can't deny it. And I think it might have even been a combination of both. I think, yes, Randy Savage could be a little high-strung. He could be a little jealous at times, and Elizabeth probably did, you know, some things to hurt him here or there. But he was also in a business where nobody can be trusted, you know, and he had to be careful and be uh, mindful of his wife and make sure that none of these assholes, you know, tried anything with her. He wasn't going to tolerate any sort of betrayal or anything like that. So he was just, a, it was, I think it was a combination of both of those things. But what was interesting is when you fast forward to when they did the marriage angle, when Elizabeth came back in 1991 and helped uh, Randy out at WrestleMania 7, and then they did the big wedding at SummerSlam that year. This was when the marriage was on the rocks. And you always have to wonder, looking back, you know, Vince McMahon should have been aware of this. I'm sure he knew of the problems with Randy and Liz. He knew about Randy's jealousy issues in the past. I'm almost, I almost think this is kind of a dick move. Because what did it really do for business at that time? Yes, it was technically the main event of SummerSlam that year, a fucking wedding. But really, they could have done without it and business would have maintained. It's not like the wedding angle was carrying the promotion or anything like that. So for Vince to want to go ahead and do something like this, or the WWE in general, wanting to do an angle like this with two people that they know this might be uncomfortable for them. I don't know. I don't know what Vince's reasoning sometimes are. I think anytime you know, the lines are blurred between reality and wrestling, that's when Vince likes it the best. That's why he always likes guys to feud with each other who hate each other in real life. But with this, you know, looking back, I almost wish they wouldn't have done it because you have to imagine it must have been hard for both of them to have to put on this persona, this facade of a happily newly wedded couple when in reality they've been married for almost 10 years and they're about to be divorced. And they eventually did divorce. It wasn't long after their SummerSlam match. Elizabeth was with him at WrestleMania when he won the title from Ric Flair and then after that she really wasn't around. I don't believe she was there when Savage defended the title at Wembley uh, against Warrior. I could be wrong. You guys can fill me in. Somebody take a look at the tape but I'm pretty sure she was gone by that point. And they actually have Hogan who tells the story This is one of those things where it's just like, uh, Hogan, you know, I just hope you're being 100% truthful. But I've actually heard a version of this story before in shoot interviews.
interviews, but they say that one day Elizabeth just went down to Miami, which is where Hogan lived, and she stayed with Linda, who was Hogan's wife at the time. And somehow, long story short, nobody really knows the whole story, but Randy Savage uh, got very, very upset about this and held Hogan personally responsible for whatever reason, whether Hogan was really into some shady shit, whether Hogan's not being truthful, or whether Macho Man was just being crazy, enraged, and jealous like he tended to be. Who knows the real story, but bottom line is Randy Savage was pissed at Hulk Hogan for several years after that. And when they finally did divorce, they showed uh, a little excerpt of the letter. I have the magazine. I remember when I read this because uh, at the time you kind of were wondering, hey, where's Elizabeth? She's not on TV. Finally, Randy Savage puts something in the WWE magazine where he lets all the fans know that they have divorced. And it was a really heartfelt little letter. I think it was just a paragraph or two at the most. But I thought it was really cool of him to explain to the fans, like he knew that he had to, because everybody knows about Randy and Elizabeth and everything they've been through in wrestling over the years. It was his responsibility to inform everybody what really was going down. And it, it, was, uh, you know, it was something that uh, meant a lot to me. I felt bad for him. Everybody in the DVD said that it crushed him. His mother, his brother, everybody said that it really hit him hard. He wanted to make it work at all costs. It was Elizabeth, I think, that was insisting that the divorce needed to happen. And they had their split. And it's a shame because, you know, as fans, you feel like you know the two of them. You know, watched them for years, side by side, the way they were, everything they went through. And the fact that they're not together anymore, it seems like they were supposed to be together. After Savage shakes off the pain of the divorce and gets back to business in the WWE, they talk a lot about his endorsement of Slim Jim. He winds up doing a whole bunch of commercials for them, signs this big endorsement deal with them, and like triples Slim Jim sales, you know, just with his name being associated with them. The commercials were so memorable, and they were so pop culture at the time, and everybody knows, you know, snap it to a Slim Jim, we've all heard that. He would run those Slim Jim commercials constantly on WWE TV on Monday Night Raw, until of course he signed with WCW, and he took all of his Slim Jim promotions over there, you know, that pissed WWE off. But he really became the face of Slim Jim, and that's pretty remarkable when you think about it, because no other wrestler has ever crossed over like that. A lot of guys have done commercials, you know, but nobody has really been directly associated with one product. It's like Michael Jordan and Nike, Randy Savage and Slim Jim, same thing. And I was happy for him, and I was happy for wrestling that he got that exposure and he was all over TV because now these commercials started airing everywhere, not just on wrestling shows, but all over television. So everybody was getting to see Macho Man Randy Savage, and he made Slim Jims famous. I actually haven't even had a Slim Jim in about 20 years. I usually don't eat shit like that, but maybe as a tribute to Randy Savage, I'll pick one up next time I'm at my local convenience store. Now, before we get into the very personal, painful subject for me of Randy Savage leaving the WWE and heading off to WCW, why don't we take a look at the great DVD extras that were included in this three DVD set? Fucking phenomenal. This was a pleasant surprise. Now, I guess their reasonings for picking a lot of these matches is because they've already released a Randy Savage compilation a couple of years ago. It was another three-disc set that I also have, and it was just a lot of Randy Savage matches and moments, you know, some of his best ever. But in this one, they included a lot of, you know, almost non-televised matches or, or Boston Garden or MSG shows and a lot of really interesting matches that they ran when they would be on tour, and some of them I really enjoyed. You know me. This is just the regular DVD version, not the Blu-ray. You saw the intro there. That was actually actually me in a fucking Walmart buying this DVD. But anyway, on to some of these matches. On disc two, it starts off with the Intercontinental title match from Superstars in 1986 against Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. This was the match that set up the big WrestleMania three match. This is when Savage attacked him with the ring bell and crushed his throat and all of that. So they give you this match on there. I remember I watched this match as it happened, and I remember being really uncomfortable, really worried for Ricky Steamboat. It was a very well done angle, at least for the time. Looking back now, maybe it doesn't hold up as well, but back then, you didn't see too many instances like this, and it was awesome. Here's a fucking gem. Bruno Sammartino gets an intercontinental title match against Randy Savage in a lumberjack match in the Boston Garden right before WrestleMania 3 in 1987. I remember this. Savage and Bruno actually had a small little feud. Savage even had a couple of matches with Bruno's son, because Bruno, of course, was all about respect. He was kind of doing some announcing at the time. Randy Savage was very flamboyant and very disrespectful. Bruno took exception to that, and Bruno would get back in the ring from time to time, even in the 80s. Just as a little novelty, he'd wrestle in front of the Garden fans or something to give him a thrill. It was awesome when he would do that, and he was still pretty good for his age. He could still move around in that ring. He was great. And this wasn't his first match with Savage either. They had a few matches together, but this one in particular was just interesting because technically it was for the title, and it was a lumberjack match, and looking at, uh, you know, just the way that whole match was set up was just awesome to see. They also give you a little Randy Savage and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat tune-up for WrestleMania 3 about a month before this, 
this. This was, I believe, when they ran the Maple Leaf wrestling shows or whatever. So they had a match there, you know, kind of getting ready for their big showdown a month later. Here's one that I loved seeing on here. When Randy Savage turned babyface in 1987, one of his first matches came against Harley Race in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They really included a lot of these non-televised kind of house show events. They just had a different feel to them, a different environment. It was really good. It wasn't as well lit and well produced. It was a more simpler wrestling show and seeing a lot of these matches from that time period was really cool to see. Here's another one that blew my mind. I don't think I have this match anywhere. I don't remember seeing it before, but it's a six-man steel cage match from late 1987 with tag team champion Strike Force teaming up with Randy Savage. How about that? Tito and Randy Savage hooking up on the same side after all of their wars, taking on the three-man team of the Honky Tonk Man, Intercontinental Champion, and the Hart Foundation. That was awesome, and Randy Savage and Strike Force won that match, obviously. And it was also one of the few times we ever got Randy Savage and Bret Hart in the same ring together, which was also cool. They show one of his rematches with Ted DiBiase after he won the title at WrestleMania 4. This came also from the Boston Garden in July of 1988, and also a great street fight with Bad News Brown. Randy Savage came out there in, you know, full-on workout gear, and it was just a brawl, a street fight. They even broke a table in the corner, very ECW style. You never saw anything like that. I don't think I have seen this street fight before, because when I saw the table spot, it blew my mind. And the last match on disc two is one of Savage's first rematches with Hogan after he lost the belt to him at WrestleMania 5. This came from MSG in April of 1989. Disc three starts off with a bang, a very rare match between Randy Savage and Rowdy Piper. This was in Miami in January of 1990. So awesome to see that. Speaking of rare, Randy Savage has a match with Shawn Michaels from Germany. Finally, we get a big pay-per-view match from Randy Savage, his title defense against the Ultimate Warrior at SummerSlam 1992 at Wembley Stadium, which of course was awesome. And then finally, just a few from WCW. He had a WCW television title match against Arn Anderson from WCW Saturday Night. This was in January of 1995. This was one of his first matches ever in WCW. Also, his steel cage match with Ric Flair from Super Brawl 6 in February of 1996 for the WCW title. And the kick-ass death match he had with Diamond Dallas Page from Halloween Havoc 1997. That match was great. So I gotta say, the matches are excellent. I'm glad they released that three DVD set a while back of Macho Man because it allowed them to include a lot of these great gems on this DVD. And you know what I noticed? Is a lot of those matches from the Boston Garden and Madison Square Garden, they don't have the WWE logo on them, which is really interesting. It's great, sharp, clear footage without the WWE's logo stamped on it. So I was really pleasantly surprised to see that. Not that it really matters, but it is something that was noticeable, and I'm surprised. I don't know if this was an error, or if this was an omission, or if they purposely left off the the WWE logo off of this footage, but it was kind of nice to see it in its original form. Well, now, unfortunately, we have come upon my least favorite part of the DVD. I am not lying to you when I tell you that it still hurts. When Randy Savage left the WWF and went down to WCW and joined everybody else down there, Hogan and others, it was probably one of the most painful things I had experienced as a wrestling fan. It didn't even seem right that Randy Savage was not going to be in the WWE anymore. That didn't even seem like it made sense. He was such a huge part of everything that they did, you know, and they even talked about how he was basically the ambassador of the WWE. He was the face of the WWE with everybody leaving, Hogan and others, and going down to WCW. Savage was the one guy that Vince had left that was on that same level as far as recognizability goes to Hulk Hogan. Recognizability. Is that even a word? Well, fuck it. It is now. But the backstory on all of that is that Randy Savage was really not that happy being in that role, being the ambassador and being an announcer, which is what he was doing. I actually liked Randy Savage as an announcer because just like in his wrestling persona, how there was no one like him, there was no wrestling announcer like him either. He was all over the place, and sometimes I think he would unintentionally say things that were so incredibly funny that he didn't even know that he was being funny. And he entertained the hell out of me regardless of who he was doing commentary next to. He was awesome. But he felt like he still had a lot to give, and looking back, it was silly. You're like, really, Vince? You know, here you're struggling, you know, with WCW now who's taken all of your former talent. You could actually use a name like the Macho Man, so the fact that they didn't want him in the ring and in feuds anymore to me was baffling because they could use a name like that. Wrestling was in the shits, you know, when Savage was doing commentary. Lanny Poffo even tells a really interesting story, and I've heard versions of this before, but I haven't heard it talked about in this great detail, but he talks about how Randy Savage pitched the idea to the WWE of a program with Shawn Michaels. And Lanny said he pitched this angle that would last about two years that would result in Randy Savage losing to Shawn Michaels and going back to the commentary booth and basically being retired or at least semi
I retired. And I'm guessing that WrestleMania would have probably been WrestleMania 11. That's probably what Savage had in mind. Maybe they start something shortly after WrestleMania 9. Maybe instead of the ladder match with Razor at WrestleMania 10, Sean and Randy do something together, and then a full year later... Let's say maybe Randy Savage is WWE champion, not Diesel, and Shawn Michaels beats Randy Savage for the title at WrestleMania 11. Imagine how great that would have been. Bret Hart would do the honors the following year and launch Shawn, but imagine if it would have been the other way. Imagine that WrestleMania 11 main event. Nothing against Kevin Nash, nothing against Diesel, but I would have much preferred to see Randy Savage versus Shawn Michaels for the WWE title than Shawn Michaels versus Diesel. I'll tell you that. That would have been a great culmination to the feud. But the WWE, surprisingly enough, shot everything down. They did not want Randy Savage to be in the ring as much, basically not being in the ring at all because they were really going with this new generation. It was Bret Hart, it was Shawn Michaels, Diesel, Razor Ramon, Undertaker. It was this whole new breed of guys. But Savage, he was only in his early 40s. You know, you think about guys who WWE has put the belt on in later years. Savage seems young. In comparison to that, they put the belt back on Hogan when he was like fucking 50. So to me, it was a silly reason, and I think Savage was not nearly too old to wrestle because he was a hell of an athlete, and he could have wrestled well into his 40s, and it's a shame that it all worked out that way, but Savage finally gave WCW a call and ended up going down south. I will never fucking forget that night on Monday Night Raw when Vince McMahon made the announcement to all of us that Randy Savage was not in the WWE. My heart sank because I was already a little nervous about WCW as it was. They seemed to be on this mass talent acquisition of every single former 80s WWE star that they could get their fucking hands on. Everybody was over there. Hogan, Duggan, Earthquake, Boss Man, Honky Tonk, everybody. And now that Savage had gone, he was the one guy Vince had left. And I just think that I just wish, looking back, that something could have been worked out to where Savage could have stayed there. He and Vince seemed like they were friends. Vince liked Randy Savage. I thought the two of them were tight. And they actually touch on all of that in the documentary. It would have been great to see Vince McMahon interviewed for this thing. He was not. It would have been great to see Triple H or Stephanie, but they kept the whole McMahon family out of this. And yet they didn't shy away from the fact that there's a lot of unanswered questions between Randy Savage and Vince McMahon. We don't know. Something is up. And Lanny Poffo said it wasn't all on the WWE's end. Randy Savage was also pissed, and he was highly offended by the billionaire Ted skits. Now, looking back, I was laughing at the time at those billionaire Ted skits because it was just WWE way of firing back. WCW started all of this. They fired the first shots, giving away the results of Raw, attacking WWE, making fun of them, calling them out. WWE had to respond, and this was their response. The problem is, in the process, it insulted two of the guys that helped build the WWE, and Randy Savage, according to Lanny Poffo, really took it seriously, how they made fun of his age and how they made fun of his bald spot. And then when they did the uh, Larry Fling segment, and Larry Fling asked Randy Savage about Elizabeth, and then Hogan and Randy both answered at the same time, Randy took that as an insinuation that Hulk Hogan and Miss Elizabeth were having an affair, and they crossed the line. And looking back, he's right. They did cross the line. Miss Elizabeth was a very sensitive subject for Randy Savage. You know, he worked with the WWE for so long for them to personally insult him, and given the type of person that Randy Savage is, you can see he's probably going to be pissed off about that. So there was animosity on both sides right from the start. When Savage first got over to WCW, there was some bad blood, but he accomplished a lot in WCW. He had numerous world title reigns there. He had a great program with Diamond Dallas Page, and DDP is also on this uh, documentary as well, and he really puts over how Randy really wanted to do business and really liked working with DDP, saw a lot of potential in him, and I love the run that they had. You didn't see too many feuds like that in WCW that got you excited, that had that feel, and their matches were good. You know, these two guys were in their 40s, and they were going out there having the match of the year, you know, a brutal street fight death match or whatever it was, a Halloween Havoc that year, I think 1997. It was amazing. So I wouldn't at all say that WCW ruined Randy Savage. He's one guy that when he got over there, you know, they treated him well. He did some things that wasn't so great as well. WCW had a lot of hokey gimmicks and storylines and angles, especially when he first came in. But his body of work in WCW is pretty impressive, and he accomplished a lot there. Now, interestingly enough, Miss Elizabeth was also in WCW at that time, so he was reunited with his ex-wife, and they really didn't get much into that. They didn't really touch on his relationship with Elizabeth while he was in WCW after the divorce, but of course, there was a ton more Hogan drama. Mean Gene Okerlund, Kevin Nash, and others all referenced uh, the heat that Hogan would have with Brandy Savage while they were in WCW. One week, they would be best friends drinking beer. The next week, they were on completely opposite ends of the locker room, and there was just this ongoing lifetime tension between these two fuckers that just seem to always exist. 
Now, Savage had gotten injured, I think, around 98, 99, whenever that was, and he had to have uh, some knee surgeries. And when he came back, he kind of had a different look to him, changed up his uh, gimmick a little bit, and started showing up with the three women, who I believe was Molly Holly, Medusa, and I think his wife, Gorgeous George. Uh, did he marry her, or were they just dating? I forget. I'm pretty sure he married her. They didn't really talk about that either. They didn't get into his relationship with Gorgeous George at all, but they showed uh, his brief stint as Team Madness that he had going on. And it was just another example of how he reinvented himself, changed with the time, athletically he was not what he once was so he started really working out and getting bigger of course they don't touch much on the steroids Randy Savage of course we all know did take steroids it's pretty well documented you could even tell that by looking at him but luckily they really painted Randy Savage in a really good light now what happens next is when WCW gets bought out Vince McMahon buys WCW. We all remember that. And what happens? All of these former WWE wrestlers start to come home. Hogan, Nash, Hall, Ric Flair, everybody was coming back to the WWE, except for one guy, Randy Savage. And this is where you get the rumors starting up again, because we've all heard the rumors of Stephanie McMahon. We've all heard them. They've been out there. Nobody seems to know why this rumor exists or where it came from, but apparently some people think that Randy Savage had an affair with Stephanie McMahon when she was young. And that is why he is blacklisted from the WWE. That's why Vince McMahon did not even acknowledge his existence after he left. And apparently it might have been the only thing to explain why Randy Savage was never allowed back in when everybody else had seemingly more heat with Vince than he did. Why is he the one that doesn't come back? And you know what? They went there. I can't believe they went there. Now, Randy Savage put that video up on his website years ago where he responds to some interview that Triple H had where he called him a dinosaur and it pissed him off. So Randy Savage, of course, was very full of energy and very high strung back then. This might have even been around the same time that he released that rap album, remember? So Savage seemed like he was going a little crazy. But in the video, he calls out not only Hulk Hogan, but Triple H says he's going to slap the shit out of him and take his wife Stephanie now imagine that imagine if there was something that happened between Randy Savage and Stephanie McMahon years ago that nobody knows about except Vince that was a direct slap right in Vince and Stephanie's face and that could be a really good reason why we never saw Randy Savage in the WWE it supports the claim that maybe something did go on I don't see how that's possible Randy Savage has been with beautiful women in his life you know during the time that this affair would have taken place, Stephanie would not have been that old and not even been that good looking. She's much hotter now than she would have ever looked in 1993, if you ask me. So to me, the affair really didn't make any sense because of the enormous age difference between the two that would have had to exist in and the fact that Randy Savage, you know, it's not hard for him to get women. He's had some of the most beautiful women ever in the history of the wrestling business, so it's not like he's desperate. So why he would prey on a young Stephanie McMahon to me seemed odd. To me, I just always denied the rumors because I'm like, there's no fucking way. That makes no sense. Why the fuck would those two, of all people, have anything to do with each other romantically or sexually? To me, it made no sense. But I got to tell you, the WWE almost added fuel to this fire, added fuel to this rumor that maybe it really is true. My instincts tell me it is not. But you know what? We cannot 100% confirm that. And I don't think we ever will be able to. And that's exactly what they say in the documentary. We will never know. Now, if I wasn't down in the dumps as it was, reliving the nightmare of Randy Savage leaving the WWE for WCW, now we have to talk about the unfortunate and tragic death of Miss Elizabeth. Not a good day for good mic work. As a matter of fact, not a good year for any of us. 2003, how many people did we lose? Miss Elizabeth, Mr. Perfect, Road Warrior Hawk, Crash Holly, Stu Hart. I mean, the list goes on and on. And this is one that hit everybody hard. Fans and wrestlers, nobody wanted to see Miss Elizabeth die. She was a sweetheart. Sure, she was not perfect. And the reason she died is because she combined too many pills with too much alcohol and she basically unintentionally took her own life. Horribly tragic and horribly frustrating that things like this happen in wrestling, all of these people that we have lost, and Miss Elizabeth was one of those that just stung a little bit more because she was a woman, and she was so beautiful, and she was the picture of innocence in pro wrestling. We looked at her as a queen. She truly is the first lady of the World Wrestling Federation, and for her to die the way she did, you know, for people that knew her and loved her and watched her on TV, it, it was not easy. And, uh, you know, to this day, I mean, it's been 11 years since she died and I'm uh, 
you know, not over it. Not to mention what it did to Randy Savage. You think it didn't hit him hard, you know, when they talk about how it really, uh, you know, it probably was emotional for him. And I think he did reach out to the family, you know, and uh, told him he would do whatever they needed for him and uh, offered his condolences and I believe sent flowers, all that stuff. Uh, so it was nice to see that he at least reached out. And I know it had to hit him hard because ex-wife or not, his history with, with Elizabeth goes back, you know, 30 years. So it, it must have been hard. I felt bad for Randy Savage. I felt bad for everyone that had a relationship with her. Believe it or not, I felt bad for Lex Luger. You know, he wasn't into the greatest things back then either he was in a very dark place in his life and he was being very irresponsible but still he has to live with that guilt for the rest of his life i think he was very negligent and the two of them were extremely irresponsible and uh, he could have done things to help liz or save her but at the end of the day he didn't shove the pills down her throat and i do feel bad that lex luger has to live with that guilt for the rest of his life and now we're winding up the documentary. It tries to end on a much lighter of a tone. Randy Savage now moves on from Miss Elizabeth's death, and they talk about how he does, you know, so much charitable work in the community and how he's so recognizable and all of the wonderful things he does for kids and shows a really, really nice side of Randy Savage. And Randy Savage has always been charitable, all the way back to his early days in the WWE. He was always signing autographs and meeting and greeting people and doing public appearances. Randy Savage always enjoyed this part of his job a lot, and he did a lot for children. And especially in the community that he lived down there in Florida, he did a lot for, you know, where he lived. And it was great. You know, Randy Savage was a very charitable, very kind-hearted person. And they showed that in a really nice light in the documentary. He even comes full circle and winds up reuniting with a former girlfriend from 30 or 40 years prior when he was playing baseball when he was young, probably just out of high school. They wind up reuniting, you know, all these years later, and they got married in 2010. And a lot of people said on the DVD that whenever they talked to Randy, he was as happy as he had ever been. He really felt, and a lot of people did, that she was the true love of his life. And I think the only reason they broke up was because of wrestling or baseball and travel, and they just kind of grew apart. And when he got with her, it seemed like, according to everybody, that he was really at peace, and he was as happy as he had ever been, and now he was in the twilight of his life. He's going to live the last remaining years that he has with, you know, a beautiful bride, somebody that he's madly in love with and has known for many, many, many years, and he's kind of come full circle, and it had kind of a happy ending, sort of, because less than one year later, or maybe just over one year later, he suffers the heart attack while driving, crashes his car into a tree, and dies. Motherfucker. Absolutely heartbreaking, absolutely tragic end to Randy Savage's life, and he died, you know, at least 20 years too young. The frustration in the wrestling deaths is boiling over, to be honest with you. And this is one of the ones that I just didn't want to have to hear about. As if we haven't suffered enough, as if us as wrestling fans, and just wrestling people in general, haven't suffered enough from tragic death after tragic death after tragic death, to hear something like this finally when Randy Savage has just made peace with his life and has finally settled down where he can live in happiness for many years to come. He suffers a cardiac episode and winds up dying, you know, so young. And just a year after he had began his new life that had made him so happy. It's frustrating. It's sad. It pisses you off. It makes you want to cry. It makes you want to scream. It makes you want to everything. It's just a shame. Randy Savage was too important to my wrestling childhood to want to see die. I wasn't ready for that. None of us were. Uh, and it hit me hard. And like so many others, uh, not over it to this day. I mean, Ultimate Warrior got to do what I wished Randy Savage would do. You know, an Ultimate Warrior died the very next day after all of that happened. I wish we could have at least seen Randy Savage come full circle, not only in his life and with his new wife, but with the WWE. Say hello to the fans one more time under a WWE umbrella, people that loved him in that environment so much. Get inducted to the Hall of Fame. Come back and have one last farewell. Patch up everything that you've had wrong with the McMahons and WWE and just and do that. I think it would have been such a nice seal, a nice cap on his career. And the fact that now we have to do all of this without him is a shame. So anyway, there you go. That's my review of the Macho Man Randy Savage DVD. I could go on for 20 more minutes talking about how much I love the guy, but I think I've made that apparently clear. And you guys know how much I loved him. I'm sure a lot of you did, too. Long live the macho man Randy Savage. I will be back up very, very soon with two pay-per-view reviews. Until then, peace.